and let's talk about the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So maybe this is a good time to try to talk about its history, about its origins, about what kind of stuff it works on, about biosafety levels, and about Batwoman. Yeah, Shi Zheng Li. Yes. Shi Zheng Li. Uh, so what what is the Wuhan Institute of Virology? When did it start? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, after SARS-1, which was in the early 2000, 2003, 2004, um, there was this effort to, um, uh, to enhance, as I mentioned before, global capacity, including in China. So the Wuhan Institute of Virology had been around for decades before then. Uh, but there was an agreement between the French and the Chinese governments to build a the largest BSL-4 lab, so biosafety level four. So in these what are called high containment labs, there's level four, which is the highest level. And people have seen that in, on TV and elsewhere where you have uh, the, the people in the different in suits and all of these protections. And then there's level three, which is still very serious uh, and uh, but not as much as as level four, and then level two is just kind of goggles and and some gloves and maybe that and maybe a face mask, much less. So, the French and the Chinese governments uh, they agreed that France would help build the first and and still the largest BSL four plus some mobile BSL three labs, and they were going to do it in Wuhan, and Wuhan is kind of like uh, China's Chicago. And I had actually been, it's a different story, I'd been in Wuhan relatively um, uh, not that long before the pandemic uh, broke out. And that was why I knew that Wuhan is, a, it's, a, it's not some backwater where there are a bunch of yokels eating bats for dinner every night. This is a really sophisticated, wealthy, highly educated and, and, and cultured city. And so I, I knew that it wasn't like, that even the Huanan seafood market wasn't like some of these seafood markets that they have in southern China or in Cambodia, where I lived for uh, for two years. I mean, this it's it was a, a totally well, different thing. I'm going to have to talk to you about some of the food, including the Wuhan market, just some of the wild food going on here because you've traveled that part of the world. Yeah, but let's not get there. Yeah, let's, okay, let's not good. get distracted. Good as I was telling you, Lex, before, and this is maybe an advertisement. Yes, um, is having now listened to to a number of your your podcasts when I'm doing long ultra training runs or driving in the mountains. Like the really, because in the beginning, we have to yeah. talk about whatever it is is the topic, but yeah. the really good stuff happens later. So So friends, you should listen to the end. I, I you know, I, I have to say, as I was telling you before, like when I heard your long podcast with Jerron Lanier and he talked about his mother at the very end, I mean, it was just beautiful stuff. So I don't know whether I can I can match beautiful stuff, but I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna do my best. So you're gonna have to find out exactly. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, so um, so France had this agreement um, that they were going to help design and help build uh, this BSL four um, lab in Wuhan, and um, it was going to be with uh, French standards, and there were going to be fifty French experts who were going to work there and supervise the, the work that happened even after the Wuhan Institute of, of Virology um, uh, in, in the new location um, uh, started, uh, started operating. Uh, but then when they started building it, uh, the, the French contractors, the, the, the French overseers were increasingly appalled um, that they had less and less control, that the Chinese uh, contractors were swapping out new things. They, it wasn't built up to French standards so much um, that at the end, when it was finally built, uh, the, the, the person who was the vice chairman of the project and a leading French uh, industrialist named Mariot refused to sign off. And he said, we, we can't um, support, we have no idea um, what this is, whether it's safe or not. And when this, this lab opened, remember it was supposed to have 50 French experts, it had one French expert. And so the, the French were really disgusted. And actually, when the Wuhan Institute of Virology in its new location opened in, in 2018, um, two things happened. One, French intelligence privately approached US intelligence saying, we have a lot of concerns about the Wuhan Institute of Virology about its safety, and we don't even know who's operating there. Is it being used as a, a dual-use uh, facility? And also in 2018, the U.S. Embassy in Beijing uh, sent some people down to Wuhan to go and look at, well, at this laboratory. 
And they wrote a scathing cable that Josh Rogan from the Washington Post later got his his hands on saying, um, this is really unsafe. They're doing work on dangerous bat coronaviruses in conditions where a, a leak is, uh, is is possible. And so then you mentioned Shu Zheng Li, and I'll, I'll connect that to the, these virologists who I was 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 talking about. So there's a very credible thesis um, that because um, these pathogenic outbreaks happen in other parts of the world, having partnerships with experts in those parts in those parts of the world must be a foundation of our of our efforts. We can't just bring everything home because we know that that viruses don't care about borders and boundaries. And so if something happens there, it's, it's going to, to come here. So very correctly, um, we have all kinds of partnerships um, with experts in, in these labs. And Shu Zheng Li um, was one of those partners. And her closest relationship was with Peter Daszak, who's a British, I think now American, but the the president of a thing called EcoHealth Alliance, which was getting money from NIH. And basically, EcoHealth Alliance was a pass-through organization. And, and you know, over the years, it was only about $600,000. So almost all of her funding came from the Chinese government, but there's a little bit that came from the United States. And so she became their kind of leading expert and the, the point of contact uh, between the Wuhan Institute of Virology and um, certainly Peter Daszak, but also uh, also with with others, and that was why in the earliest days of the outbreak, I didn't mention that. Um, I did mention that there, there were these virologists who had this fake certainty that they knew it came from nature and it didn't come from a, a lab, and they called people like me conspiracy theorists just for raising that that possibility. But when Peter Daszak was organizing that effort in February of 2020. What he said is, we need to rally behind our Chinese colleagues. And that the basic idea was um, these international collaborations are under threat. And I think it was because of that, because Peter Daszak's basically his, his major contribution as a scientist was just tacking his name on work that Xu Zheng Li had largely done. Um, he was defending a lot, certainly for himself and his organization. So you think uh, EcoHealth Alliance and uh, Peter is less about money, it's more about kind of um, almost like legacy because you're so attached to this work? Is this just I, on I a human level? I think so. I, I think so. I mean, I, I've been criticized for being actually, I'm, I'm certainly a big critic of Peter Daszak, uh, but I've been criticized by some for being too lenient. I mean, it's so easy to say, oh, somebody, they're like, an evil ogre and just trying to do evil and and cackling in their in their closet or whatever. But I think for most of us, even those of us who do terrible, horrible things, the story that we tell ourselves and we really believe is that we're doing the thing that we most believe in. I mean, I did my PhD dissertation on the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. They genuinely saw themselves as idealists. They, they, they thought, well, we need to make radical change to build a better future. And the, what they described as, what they felt was radical change was, was a monstrous atrocity so, by us. So the criticism here of Peter is, uh, is that uh, he was uh, part of an organization that was kind of... Um, well, funding an effort that was an unsafe implementation of a biosafety level four laboratory. Well, a few things. So what he thought he was doing um, was, and, and what he thought he was doing is itself highly controversial because there's one there that um, in 2011, um, there were, I know you've talked about this with other guests, but in, in 2011, uh, there were the first um, published papers on this now infamous gain of function uh, research. And, and basically what they did, um, both in, um, uh, in different labs, and certainly in the United States, in, in uh, Wisconsin, and in, uh, in the Netherlands, was they had a bird flu virus that was, that was very dangerous, but not massively uh, transmissive. And they they had a, a gain of function process through what, what's called serial passage, which means basically passing a virus like natural selection, but forcing natural selection by just passing a virus through 
at different cell cultures and then selecting for what it is that, that you want. So relatively easily, they took this deadly but not massively transmissive virus and turned it into, in a lab, a deadly and transmissive virus. And that showed that this is really dangerous. And so there were, at that point, there was a huge controversy. There were some people um, like Richard Ebright and Mark Lipsitch at Harvard who were saying um, that this is really dangerous. We're in the, the, the idea that we need to create monsters to study monsters. I, I think I, maybe even you have said that in the past. Uh, it doesn't make sense because there's an unlimited number of monsters. And so what are we going to do? Create an unlimited number of monsters. And if we do that, eventually the monsters are, are going to get out. Then there was the Peter Daszak camp, and he got a lot of funding, uh, particularly from the United States, who said, well, and, and certainly Collins and Fauci were supportive of this. And they thought, well, there's a safe way to go out into the world to collect the world's most dangerous viruses and to poke and prod them um, to figure out how they might mutate, how they might become more dangerous with the goal of predicting um, future pandemics. And that certainly never happened with the goal of creating uh, vaccines and treatments. And that largely uh, never happened. But that was, so Peter Daszak kind of epitomized that, uh, that second, uh, second approach. Um, and as, as you've talked about in the past, in 2014, there was a funding moratorium in the United States. And then in 2017, uh, that was lifted. It didn't affect the funding that went to the, uh, to the EcoHealth Alliance. Um, so when this happened in, in in the beginning, and again coming back to Peter's motivations, I don't think um, I, the, here's the best case scenario for for Peter. I'm going to give you if, if what I imagine he was thinking, and then I'll tell you what I actually think. So I think here's what he's thinking. Um, this is most likely a natural origin outbreak. It, it, it just like SARS one. In, again, in Peter's hypothetical mind. Just like SARS-1, this is most likely a natural uh, outbreak. We need to have an international coalition in order to fight it. If we allow um, these political attacks to undermine our Chinese counterparts and the trust in this re these relationships that we've built over many years, we're really screwed because they have the most local knowledge of these outbreaks. And even though, and, and this guy gets a lot more complicated, even though there are basic questions that anybody would ask and that Shu Zheng Li herself did ask about uh, the origins of this pandemic, even though Peter Daszak, and I'll mention this, I'll describe this in a moment, had secret information that we didn't have that in my mind massively in increases the possibility of a lab incident origin, I, Peter Daszak, would like to guide the public conversation uh, in the direction where I think it should go and in in support of the kind of international collaboration that I think is necessary. That, that's a strong positive discussion because it's true that there's a lot of political BS and a lot of uh, kind of just uh, bickering and lies as we've talked about. And so it's very convenient to say, you know what, let's just ignore all of these quote unquote lies and my favorite word, misinformation. Yeah. Uh, and then because the way out from this serious pandemic is for us to work together. So let's strengthen our partnerships yeah. and everything else is just like noise. Yeah, so let's, and, and so then now I wanna do my personal indictment of Peter Daszak because that, <laughs> that's my view, but I wanted to fairly- That's nice, yeah. Because I think that-, that you know, we all tell ourselves stories, and 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 I th and and also when you're a science communicator, um, you can't in your public communications give every doubt that you have or every nuance. You kind of have to summarize things, and so I think that he was, again, in this this benign interpretation, trying to summarize in the way that he thought the the conversations should go. Here's my indictment of Peter Daszak. And I, uh, I, I, it's, I feel like uh, Brutus here, but uh, I, um, <laughs> I, I've not come here to praise um, uh, Peter Daszak because um, while Peter Daszak was doing all of this and making all of these statements about, well, we pretty much know it's a natural origin, uh, then there was this February 2020 Lancet letter 
where it turns out, and we only knew this later, um, that he was highly manipulative. So he was uh, recruiting all of these people. He drafted the the infamous letter calling people like me uh, conspiracy theorists. He then wrote to people like Ralph Barrick and Linfa Wang, who are also very high profile virologists saying, well, let's not put our names on it. So it doesn't look like we're doing it, even though they were doing it. He didn't um, uh, disclose a lot of information that, so it, that they had. It was a strategic move. So just uh, uh, in case people are not familiar, Feb February 2020, Lancet letter was uh, TLDR is uh, lab leak hypothesis is a conspiracy theory. Essentially, yes. So, um, so like with the authority of science, correct. not saying like it's highly likely, saying it's obvious, duh, it's yes. uh, uh, it's natural origin. Everybody else is just uh, is everything else is just misinformation. And look, there's a bunch of really smart people that sign this. Therefore, it's true. Yeah. Not only that, so there were um, the people who 27 people signed that letter, and then after President Trump cut funding uh, to Eco Health Alliance, then he organized 77 Nobel laureates to to have a public letter criticizing that. But what Peter knew then that we didn't fully know is that. In March of 2018, EcoHealth Alliance, in partnership with the Wuhan Institute of Virology and others, had applied for a $14 million grant um, to DARPA, which is kind of like the, the VC side of the venture capital side of the, of the Defense Department. They're kind of where they do kind of big ideas. Um, uh, by the way, as a tiny tangent, I've gotten a lot of funding from DARPA. They fund a lot of excellent robotics research. And Unrelated. DARPA is incredible. Yeah. And among the things that they applied for is that we, meaning Wuhan Institute of Virology, is going to go and it's going to collect the most dangerous bat coronaviruses in southern China. And then we, as this, uh, as this group, are going to genetically engineer these viruses um, to insert a furin cleavage site. So I think when, when everyone's now seen the image of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, it has these little spike proteins, these little things that, that stick out, which is why they call it a coronavirus. Within that spike protein are these furin cleavage sites, which basically help with get the virus getting access into our cells. And they were going to genetically engineer these furin cleavage sites into these bat coronaviruses, uh, the Serbico viruses. Uh, and then, and so then, a year and a half later, what do we see? We see a bat coronavirus with a furin cleavage site unlike anything that we've ever seen before in that category of SARS-like coronaviruses. That, well, yes, I mean, it, it, the, the DARPA very correctly didn't support that application. 